Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for tonight's webinar. Um, as the title suggests, it's on our small group departures, uh, which are expert-led. Uh, my name is Justin, Justin Waltridge, and I have the pleasure of running Steps Travel. I'm delighted to say that tonight I'm joined by Lara, Lara Paxton. Lara is our um, wonderful groups manager, and also by Jared, Jared Kite, who is our chief experience officer. Now, Jared and Lara are going to talk us through uh, a number of different group trips, uh, a number of slides for maybe some 25, 30 or so minutes. Uh, and then after that, we're, we're happy to answer any questions. Now, some of you have kindly sent in questions already, uh, and we'll try and deal with those, answer those as we go through. Um, but if you have any questions while we're speaking, please send them through via the chat function. And again, we will try and answer those. Um, and if we don't get time during the actual talks to do so, we will uh, come to them at, at the end. Um, but first, what's happening at Steps Travel? What's happening in the world of travel? I, I know there's information overload at the moment. Um, when's the destination going to be uh, open? Um, how's it going to open? Um, but we're trying to cut through that noise. Um, our team are very much here, whether physically in the office or working from home. Um, they're working for you, our clients. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for being so uh, empathetic and patient through, through all of this. We're also working to uh, emerge from uh, this pandemic uh, better uh, to make sure that uh, travel has a better uh, positive impact. Uh, and that's very, very much something that we're focusing on and, and working behind the scenes. And I think that we all have to redefine the lens through which we see travel. I think we have to travel less, but we have to travel better going forward. Now that's enough for me. Um, I know that there's been a number of questions uh, beforehand as to when our group trips will uh, open up or restart uh, and which ones will do so. So I'm delighted to hand over to Lara to perhaps uh, try and answer that. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, Justin. Um, so just to start, after what was due to become a promising start to 2020, which I think feels like a long time ago for all of us, um, in January and February, February, we actually managed to run some tours. Uh, we had a number of trips. We had Gabon, Antarctica, Japan and Russia before the coronavirus struck. And then all the remaining 2020 tour departures from March to December uh, were postponed to 2021. With the constant changing travel and quarantine rules, it's made it logistically too hard to try and coordinate these trips. A lot of work goes into the logistics of our tours, from choosing the right season to travel, sourcing the best leaders, checking their availability, creating the itinerary, checking the museum, site openings, amongst other details. Therefore, when postponing a tour, we have to start from scratch and begin the process again. So whilst it's been a shame to all involve postponing these year's tours, our client safety had to take priority, and that's where hard decisions were made. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank all our clients and tour leaders for their patience and understanding this year. It has been massively appreciated by myself and the whole team at Steps. So in June, we were ready to release our exciting new group tours brochure, showcasing a number of new trips that we have planned for Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Spain, um, as well as classic trips, including Borneo, Canada, Central Asia. However, due to the constant changing situation, this was put on hold. Um, but for those wanting a full list of our tools, the best way to see this is on our website. If you go to the homepage, look under the holidays tab, there's a selection, uh, a section for group tours and the group tour calendar will give you the overview of all the tours that we offer. You can search by month, country, tour type um, or just call one of the team. They are there, the normal kind of steps hours. So give them a call and they can send you any details on itineraries. So over the last couple of months, we've been looking ahead at the logistics for our 2021 tours. Our primary focus right now is the tours departing the beginning of 2021 to see if they can run. As such, we're in constant communication with our ground agents, tour leaders, and looking at the specific rules of each country, as well as our own government rules. We will then continue to work chronologically through the tour departures as we have done this year. Um, already, there have been a number of tours and boat charters that were due to depart early 2021, which we've already decided to postpone. This includes our India River Cruise with the William Dalrymple. But for anyone interested, we do have the 2022 dates, so get in touch. Um, and finally, looking further ahead, I am busy working on our 2022 group tour programme, which I hope to have the final list available in the next few months. I'm also looking in some cases at 2023 departures, uh, especially for classic trips such as Uzbekistan, Georgia and Eastern Turkey. So for those that are looking or thinking further ahead in the future, speak to one of the team um, and check all the up-to-date information. 
Can, can I just jump in there quickly, Laura? I know yeah. it has been a, a massive uh, logistical headache for you uh, and the rest of the team, but um, I know that you've thanked others, the tour leaders and, and clients for their patience. Uh, but I think it's a, appropriate that we thank you for all that you've done to make sure that, as you say, that clients have been looked after uh, and that we've uh, postponed to dates later in the year. So thank you all for your hard work. Thank you. Um, so now I know that a number of you that are on this webinar have traveled with us before. Um, but has also travelled with other operators. So I want to highlight now with the opportunity why, why travelling with STEPS is different to other tour operators on the market. For our groups, firstly and possibly most importantly right now is group size. We have always offered one of the smallest group sizes of any group tour specialist. Our cultural tours, the maximum number of people is 15 with an average group size of 8 to 10. Um, and our wildlife tours are smaller with a sort of 6 to 10 um, average. That depends on the location and the type of wildlife experience. This group tour is so important to us because it puts the experience of the tour at the forefront and it allows you to social distance during bus journeys and all of that in sites a lot kind of easier. Another factor is our tour experts or our tour leaders. From award-winning photographers to university lecturers, authors, conservationists, and even a Russian princess, we have an enviable pool of experts that accompany our tours. It is a privilege to work with the pool of experts that we do. Not only are they incredibly knowledgeable, they bring our tools and the countries that they visit alive with their passion and allow privileged access and experiences that we wouldn't get without them. These can be anything from one-on-one -on -one photography tuition, behind the scenes museum access and real on the ground conservation insight. And then following on from that, not only do we have some amazing experts when you travel, we have some experts at steps. In fact, I personally think we have some of the best experts in the industry. These, um, the team at steps help create the trips. So it's all very much a team effort and it's through their own experiences and traveling to the destinations that they put these tours together. Whether speaking to Paul about Central Asia, Chris about African wildlife or Roxy about Canada's bears, because she really loves the bears. And also Charlotte about the wonders of India. Their passion is evident in the tours that they help create and sell. Now I've spoken about the experts and um, our tour leaders, but who joins a steps trip? Well, our group clients are well-traveled, like-minded people who have an interest in the cultures and wildlife of the destination. They are clients that appreciate that steps tours include a tour expert, as well as an English speaking local guide, good accommodation, transport, internal flights, most meals, and even gratuities in the tour cost. In recent years, we've also offered free single supplements for a number of tours, and this is something we continue to focus on as we are aware that around 30% of our group tour clients are solo travellers. International flights are not included and this allows you the flexibility to book with who you want departing from where suits you. And lastly, as with all our tailor-made bookings, we're now offering flexibility in terms of our booking conditions. So for our group tours, if you have a look, we have a dedicated web page for the group tours terms and conditions, so please have a look online for those. Um, and so another kind of addition to what makes our tools so brilliant is some of the partnerships that we've managed to obtain. So we have a long history. Oh, sorry, just before you go on to that, I just want to um, say Sue Flood has just shouted out, um, um, saying great job to you. Um, Sue's one of our uh, wonderful leaders, uh, and I, I totally agree with that, Sue. Uh, and hopefully in what you just said about our group trips answers one of the questions there was, uh, Chris Clare was asking about, um, two other companies I've not heard of, Intrepid and Explorer, I don't know who they are, um, about their about their group tours and why we're different. So I think that you've uh, very articulately said why. Um, sorry, over to partnerships. Partnerships. Um, so yeah, we've had a long history of working with some incredible partners, including Galapagos, Galapagos Conservation Trust, Orangutan Foundation, and Tofton India. And over the last few years, we've developed these further. And they now include new scientists, friends of Scott Polar Research Institute and the European Nature Trust. Through these partnerships, we've been able to develop our tour portfolio even further and create some unique tours exclusive to steps, which now include the chance to dig for dinosaurs in the Gobi Desert on our paleontology tour in Mongolia, or learn about the first-hand pioneering conservation efforts relating to palm oil and wildlife in Malaysian Borneo. These are just two of the selection of new tours that we're offering in partnership with a global science magazine, New Scientist. Also, um, we work with the friends of the Scott Polar Research Institute. In February this year, a small group actually departed from New Zealand and headed to Antarctica's Ross Sea by expedition ship, 
all unaware of the pandemic sweeping the world as they explored one of the most remote regions on the planet. And we've partnered with them again in August 2021. This time they set sail from Svalbard, traveling to Greenland and Iceland. And then finally, we've established a tailor-made and group travel partnership with the European Nature Trust, which Jared will talk more about. As part of this, we have a new tour to Northern Spain, accompanied by Duncan Grossart, who was the director of the European Nature Trust. So I know a number of you have asked questions relating to how group travel will change from now on. Right now, as I mentioned, we have to focus on safety of clients. However, when we do find it safe to run our tours again, we will be looking at a number of new procedures for our tours. As I mentioned, group size, having smaller groups will help us achieve social distancing whilst traveling. In terms of transport, hand sanitizers will be provided on board or transport, and we will now use larger transport, allowing ample distance seating on buses, and buses will be cleaned daily. We will look at doing health and safety audits, working with our brand agents and looking at the accommodation to require that these services pass the COVID-19 hygiene and cleanliness tests. In terms of local medical resources, all our experts and local guides will have up-to-date knowledge of the nearest clinics during the whole itinerary. And we actually had this in action when we had a trip run in Japan earlier this year, and we had made sure that all of the clients were up to date with the local hospitals. And so we were very aware of this kind of procedure. Looking at kind of dining options, this will be flexible again. So we'll aim to increase the use of socially distanced outdoor restaurants, as well as using smaller tables um, will be used. Buffets will no longer be used and packed lunches prepared in an enhanced in hygiene environment will also be offered. And then flexible payments such as reduced deposit amounts, a cooling off period during, during which time your deposit is 100% refundable and a final, final payment date much later than normal. And then lastly, travel insurance. Our new Campbell Irvine direct policy includes medical expenses and cancellation cover for coronavirus. And finally, we need you. It's important during the trips, as and when we get them up and running again, that the travellers take responsibility for themselves. If at any point anyone feels ill or just isn't feeling up to kind of scratch, get in touch with either the leader or the local guide as soon as possible and then we can move forward and look at the kind of procedures from there. Thank you for that, Laura. I think that you've uh, answered the questions from Jackie, uh, Emmanuel and Suzanne about social distancing. Um, there was one other one um, from Penelope about fitness. Um, I think maybe it was in terms of uh, whether it's how, how fit do you have to be to come on to trip? And I think that's that's COVID aside. So do you want to um, I think in terms of fitness, it will differ depending on the types of trips. Um, the majority of them tend to be sort of moderate fitness levels. On our website, we actually have an activity key. So all of our group tours have been um, rated depending on the kind of levels of activity. Some of our pioneering trips that we have to places like Gabon and Eritrea um, can be a bit more active in places. So they will have a higher activity level. Some of the other ones to some like our St. Petersburg trip, it would just tend to be sort of walking around sites and cities. So nothing too strenuous. But as I say, the activity here on the website is worth keeping an eye out for that. Or again, just speaking to the, the team and they will let you know how hardcore our trips are. Thank you. Um, the, moving on to sort of destinations, I know that there are a number of people asking about Central Asia. And I think Peter was asking specifically about Uzbekistan. Uh, so I was wondering if you could uh, focus maybe on Uzbekistan and talk to us about, about that trip and, uh, and what it involves. It would be my pleasure. Um, as you're now all keen and ready to travel on one of your trips, uh, Justin, myself and Jared will talk briefly about our own experiences traveling on the tours. So in 2018, I was lucky enough to travel on our Uzbekistan trip, accompanied by Chris Aslan Alexander. Um, he wrote the book Carpet Ride to Kiva, which the tour is actually named after. This tour is very much a kind of classic tour to Uzbekistan. It visits the key cultural highlight cities, Tashkent, Samarkand, Bukhara and Kiva. Um, this, the tour for 2021 also visits Nukus. Um, there is an amazing museum that the group will visit and that's the main reason that they will travel there. So I've been lucky to travel to some beautiful destinations but I have to say I was blown away by Uzbekistan. Its vibrancy, its history, its people are incredible. Possibly not food, I wouldn't go to Uzbekistan for the food. Um, but the rest of the country is just amazing. Uh, the tour that I joined began in Tashkent. A highlight for me was a trip on the underground. 
Uh, for anyone that's been to Moscow and knows the kind of beauty of the underground there, it definitely rivals that. Each of the different stations have a kind of different theme and they are stunning. So if you're ever in Tashkent, definitely go and visit the underground. Um, from here, we took a very uh, fast modern train to Samarkand. Um, Samarkand is the crossroad of cultures and it was a very important site on the Silk Route. And nowadays I have to say, it's probably the picture postcard of Uzbekistan, thanks to Rajasthan Square. And I have to say in person, it is as beautiful as the postcards make out. It is stunning. Definitely worth a visit sort of daytime, sunrise, sunset. I've managed to go and visit at all times of day and it's beautiful, really, really stunning. From there, we continued by train to Bukhara, um, Central Asia's holiest city, and this spans thousands of years. And then lastly, at the time, uh, the train line had to be completed. So we drove by coach to Kiva. Now the train line is complete, but it, it depends. They're still, it's still Uzbekistan. So it's not as reliable in terms of uh, the times of day and, and when they run. So you might be on the train, you might be on the bus. It's one of the mysteries of travel. Um, so when we arrived in Kiva, I was blown away. It's, it's so different to the other cities that you visit. It's, you walk through the city gates and you just wander the kind of inner city walls and it's like you are stepping into another era. Um, and definitely a memorable visit for me was a visit to one of the local textile workshops. This was arranged by Chris and we learned and saw the incredible skill, skillsmanship of the women's cooperative and looked at traditional Uzbek textiles. For me, I love clothes, I love all that kind of textiles, so it was really interesting to see that. We were also lucky because the April departure coincided with silkworm season. So on one of the days, one of the memorable experiences for me, we had an impromptu stop where Chris and our local guide, Porsche, jumped off of the bus, ushered us into a small kind of local house to see for ourselves silkworms will being silk just in some kind of local's back garden. Um, the people in the house could not have been friendlier. And I have to say, it's the wonder of the tours. We definitely keep a few kind of surprises up our sleeve. So when you're on the tour, it's not all, you don't always take it for granted of all that is word for word. Now over to Justin to talk more about one of our longest running and most popular tours to Indonesia and Borneo. Thank you, Lara. Um, you're very right. It is one of our longest running trips, I think for some 20 years. Um, and I'm delighted to say throughout that time, we've been running it with the Orangutan Foundation UK. Uh, and invariably, but not always, but invariably led by our wonderful friend, um, Ashley Lehman, um, OBE, who heads up the Orangutan Foundation UK. On our website, I think we list four key highlights of the trip, other, other than obviously seeing the Orangutans themselves. Um, one is that association with the Orangutan Foundation. Um, I think it's hugely important. Um, I think it opens doors, it gives you, the client, uh, on the trip, uh, a privileged insight into their work, the conservation work that they do. Um, and as I said, not only led by Ashley, we've got two trips next year, is that not right, Laura? One in June and one in November. And the one in November is a 30th anniversary uh, trip, which is going to be joined by Ian Singleton, um, obviously an orangutan specialist. He's the director of the Sumatra Orangutan Conservation Project. And again, I'm pleased to say that he was uh, recently awarded uh, an OBE for his conservation work. The other highlight that we, we list um, is Camp Leakey. Uh, camp Leakey was the camp that was set up in 1971 by Baruti Galakas uh, and named in honor, honor of her patron, uh, Louis Leakey. Uh, Louis was a paint, paleontologist, but he was fascinated by man's relationship with uh, and connection with primates. Uh, and so he sent three remarkable women, uh, Jane Goodall, uh, Diane Fossey, and Bruti Gadakas, um, out to research and look into uh, the chimpanzee, mountain gorilla, and orangutan, respectively. Um, three, as I said, remarkable women who were pioneers, uh, and we all owe so much uh, to the three of them. The other reason, um, is, as per this slide, is that um, it, your, your trip, you going there, makes a huge difference. Um, there is a donation um, it costed into every trip, which goes directly to the Orangutan Foundation. Uh, and the work that they do, uh, well, it saves habitat. Uh, it, stop, it stops uh, the destruction of habitat. It preserves habitats. Um, it goes into research. It goes into rehabilitation of orangutans that have uh, either been captured or, or, or orphaned. 
uh, and it pays for uh, forest patrols, uh, for rangers, um, etc. So by traveling to this destination, you really make a difference. And as you can see from those, um, the maps there and the, the loss of forest, um, we need to go there. Tourism travel does and can make a difference. And the, um, the next slide I think shows, um, I was lucky enough to travel there about three years ago with my family and another family. Um, and in, in terms of that access, we were, um, and, and who you know does count, uh, we were not lucky enough to go to Lamandau Wildlife Reserve where there is a, a, a baby orangutan orphanage. And uh, on the bottom left there is my elder daughter um, seeing orangutan. I'll just read from my diary that, that I kept at the time. Um, it says, the joy and wonderment um, at the privilege of observing orangutans at close quarters um, and all alone shone through. There was delight on everyone's faces at the babies in the lower branches of the small trees. We spent a joyous hour watching them, laughing at their playful antics and delighting in their inquisitive looks at us. My abiding memory was, and always will be, one of the babies reaching out towards my eldest daughter, its hand a few inches from her beaming face. Rarely have I seen such a look of such pure, unadorned joy on Isabel's face. Um, and I still remember that moment now. Um, but it wasn't just about uh, privilege like that, it was also trying to give back. Uh, there's Anna on the right-hand side planting trees, uh, and you go and learn about what's, what's happening on the ground uh, and, and the conservation work. The other highlight of going there um, is the, the river journeys. Um, you travel up and down um, the river, um, visiting the different sites, Camp Leakey, etc., um, by what's called a clotok, uh, which is an onomatopoeic word to describe these boats that chug up and down the river. Um, it's called the Sikonia River, um, blandly after a Dutch ship that sunk there in the 1970s. I prefer the, the local and the older name, which is Bu Aya, which means Crocodile River. And that sort of dangerous moniker absolutely fascinated um, all the children. Uh, and all the time they were, they, were, they were out there looking for animals. And yes, amazing bird life. Um, you see obviously orangutans, proboscis monkeys, long-tailed macaques, but the one that they wanted to see was the crocodile. And so we, they spent hours and hours just scanning for crocodile. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see one, but we did see lots of logodiles. Um, it's, um, it's an amazing experience to go there. Um, and it's amazing just to be in the rainforest. It's, it's a little bit difficult for children, but they were, they were absolutely awed by it. I'd now like to move from the, the Klotoks of Indonesia um, to uh, a different uh, boat journey um, and one to the Galapagos, uh, a, an amazing and unique place. And Jared, if you may, to say um, what we do a little bit differently there uh, and why our Galapagos trips um, are special. Thank you, Justin. Yes, um, and really continuing in that same vein with regards to the importance of tourism um, working alongside conservation. Um, that is plain to see in the Galapagos and uh, Sir David Attenborough himself has said just without tourism then the Galapagos wouldn't quite cease to exist but it would be in great peril and so you know, clearly the last six months um, has been a, um, a tough time for, for Galapagos and the Galapagos so the sooner we can get tourism back to the Galapagos the better. We wholeheartedly um, endorse boat-based tourism in the Galapagos. We feel it is the best way to explore the islands um, and we also feel it is the most sustainable way to explore the islands. We work with um, approximately a dozen or so different boats and I say boats because they are small um, and that's important going back to what Lara was saying about our group size. Um, we work with ships, boats that, that only take up to about 16 maximum people. Um, so you've got a small intimate environment um, on board. And um, you know, we choose these ships not only for their size, we choose these ships for their expertise on board, the level of service that you'll get, but also the naturalists um, with whom you'll travel and, and learn about the wonderful biodiversity on the archipelago. Um, but um, we also choose these boats for their uh, commitment to sustainable travel, um, you know, their, their environmental credentials, um, which um, you know, we believe is very important. So we can continue supporting the Galapagos and, and taking people there. Um, so we operate and we, we, we work with about a dozen or so different ships. So we can send people to the Galapagos at any different time of the year on any of these different boats that we work with. Um, but we also run some of our own set departures. So we will charter the boat outright um, and have a host on board 
that will um, be your sort of designated expert and guide, um, which I'll which I'll talk a little bit about um, in a few slides. But whilst you'll be well looked after on board, of course, the emphasis is about getting off the boat and exploring the islands, which you mainly do by foot. You do some sort of exploration in the panga boats. The pangas are like these big inflatables with good sort of robust flat bottoms. Um, so you can sort of um, explore all of the different islands by sea. But the best exploration is done on foot, um, getting out. The terrain is, is very easy to walk on. Um, all of the islands have their own sort of distinct vegetation and topography and terrain and wildlife. Um, and are very easy to explore by foot. There are very strict rules on where you can and you can't walk. Um, and the walking is not at all strenuous. If we could have the next slide, please, Nadia. Um, and of course, it is about the wildlife. And um, whilst you know, the terrestrial wildlife is, is of interest, like iguanas and tortoises, of course, um, for many, the birds um, are the big attraction um, in the Galapagos. And of course, it's well documented just how little fear these animals have. So, you know, the encounters that you have with these animals are, are particularly memorable and none more so than the wonderful blue footed booby. Quite a comical bird, I suppose, but it's become the symbol in many ways of the Galapagos. And whilst these birds are wonderful to see at any time of the year, they're particularly um, interesting to see sort of April, May, when they're in the middle of their courtship rituals when the males will use those big blue feet, slapping them up and down on the ground to attract a mate. Um, if we could have the next slide, please, Nadia. Um, so the birds, the terrestrial mammals, but for me, I think some of the most memorable wildlife experiences that I've had in the Galapagos or perhaps anywhere in the world um, is, is underwater. Um, the snorkeling that one can do in the Galapagos is spectacular. Um, nowhere else in the world can you snorkel with Galapagos penguins in the morning, playful sea lions in the afternoon, and then hammerhead sharks in the evening. Um, it, it is that diverse, it is that extraordinary. Um, and the snorkeling doesn't really require a huge amount of previous experience. Yes, you'll feel more confident um, if you've snorkeled before, but you know, just to be clear, we are talking about snorkeling here. We're not talking about sort of scuba diving. Um, and for most people, the snorkeling is, is absolutely a highlight and plenty of opportunity to get in the water to have these experiences. Thank you, Nadia. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we have our own special hosted um, exclusive trips to Steps, this particular one hosted by Liz Bonin, um, a BBC naturalist. Um, but these trips will be hosted by our experts, people like Sue Flood, wildlife photographer, uh, people like Stephen Pinker, who is an American academic and, 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 and psychologist, um, people like Jonathan Green, who, he, Jonathan is an extraordinary chap. He works with the Galapagos Islands and the Galapagos Conservation Trust, and he heads up the whale shark project that the Galapagos Conservation Trust supports. And he's recently put a tag on a whale shark um, that is clocked up something like 3,000 kilometers worth of data. Um, and they've called this whale shark hope because they do believe it has given them hope in, the, the, um, in giving them sort of data on, on the whale shark activity in the Galapagos. And um, the sad thing is that the, the data now is gone and, and they don't know where hope is. Um, it could be that she's gone off to other grounds to, 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 to breed and have her babies there. Um, it could be that she got caught up um, in some of the big fishing fleets that, that have been going into the Galapagos of late because of the issues with COVID. We just don't know. But the data they've got from this one particular whale shark that has been called Hope um, has given them a huge insight into um, the lives of these, these wonderful animals that you can see on a snorkeling trip to the Galapagos um, if you're very lucky. Thank you. Um, you talked about favourite moments, and maybe maybe you said what your favourite moment was. What's your 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 favourite experience that you've been lucky enough to have in, in the Galapagos? Um, I think the hammerhead sharks really take some beating. Um, just the 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 frisson you you feel at seeing a hammerhead shark because I recall being at school. We you know I remember there was a poster on the wall of our classroom. And it was something along the lines of lethal animals. 
And I remember this picture vividly of a hammerhead shark on this poster. So when I was in the water and I saw the unmistakable profile of a hammerhead shark, I went back to being a little boy in that classroom. And I don't mind saying that, um, yeah, the, 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 the wetsuit got a bit warmer. Um, it, was, <laughs> I was, it, was, it was thrilling, it really was. Um, and that then seeing the hammerhead shark, not one, but two, but three, and then a huge great school of them feeding on the bottom of the, the ocean. Um, yeah, that, that was an extraordinary experience. Thank you for that. Um, we've, we're asked many questions or have been asked many questions about when, when travel's uh, going to restart to different destinations. Uh, Lara's talked about the different groups and when we, we hope to run them. Um, they are difficult questions to, uh, to answer. We don't have all the answers and we have to bear with us. Um, but I think that one thing will happen, I think that we'll, we'll see travel closer to home. Uh, and I mean, in terms of regional travel. Uh, and I know, Jared, that you and your team have been, um, as Laura said earlier on, uh, working with the European Nature Trust uh, to set up a, a variety of trips um, to some of the, to some countries within Europe. Um, would you like to say a little bit more about that, if you may? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I, in my job, I get to see lots of interesting, sort of innovative holiday ideas, and um, I can safely say that what I what I see from the European Nature Trust and the trips that we've put together under the auspices of the European Nature Trust. Um, some of the most exciting holidays I think that we've put together in a long, long time. Um, and I think that's because one associates seeing megafauna um, in faraway places, maybe like the Galapagos or certainly you know, Sub-Saharan Africa or you know, the Amazon or the Pantanal. Um, we forget that we have got some amazing wildlife on our doorstep and the European Nature Trust um, along with other really innovative uh, cutting edge conservation bodies are doing their best to try and give these animals a future. And at the heart of it all is coexistence. It's a change of mindset that we all need to have that we actually can coexist with animals, with wildlife like bears, like wolves, like lynx. It just needs a change of mindset and, and just a little bit more respect, I think, for wildlife um, and a preparedness to make more of an accommodation really for wildlife. And so we're running these trips now and we do have a group tour that is running in September next year uh, with Duncan Grosshart, who was um, a director of, of European Nature Trust, has now left and doing his own things with conservation, but was instrumental in setting up a lot of these trips from the outset. Um, and that is up in Cantabria, right up in the north of, of Spain, um, in the Asturias region and um, staying in this region it, it's you know it is a wildlife experience you're going out with Duncan you're going out with rangers from the Fundacion Osopado which is a conservation body um, that tries to look after these bears um, in the national parks there in Somiedo National Park for example and um, so you're getting real privileged insight into conservation and wildlife um, with these rangers um, but you're also going to a part of Spain that um, is, doesn't see a lot of tourism. And a lot of the, the people there um, will say that this is the real Spain because the Moors didn't really get to this part of Spain at all. That was more the southern Spain. So it is a very different part of Spain that you'll see to say, you know, Andalusia, for example. Um, so the, the, the bears in this part of um, Spain, there are probably about 350 or so bears um, that you will see. Um, we're also working with a chap here by the name of Luke Massey, who's um, a BBC sort of photographer um, who um, is, is basing himself in northern Spain. Um, just go to the next slide, Nadia. I think we'll see just the, the wonderful landscape um, that Asturias and, and the Cantabrian mountains provide. This is, this is where the bears, not only bears, but also the wolves live um, and where you go out exploring, mainly on foot, You'll go out and help the rangers put in camera traps. Um, you'll go out on sort of nature hikes, birding hikes. Um, you'll go out on foraging walks. Um, and it isn't just a wildlife trip. You will also be given um, an, sort of um, a, an insight into the local culture. Um, so you'll go out and you'll meet a local cheesemaker. Um, the Cantabria is renowned for the, for the cheese that comes from that area, um, which is delicious. 
So staying in lovely little properties as well. You know, the food, when you go to Spain, food has got to be a part of the trip. Um, but but seeing what seeing this 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 wildlife in this in this environment is, is very very special. Fabulous birds as well, Nadia. If you could go on to that next slide, I think we've got the the bearded vulture there, the lammergeier, the griffon vulture, also known as. This is actually going down now into southern Spain. I think this photograph was taken um, in in Andalusia, where um, we we do a trip again under the auspices of the European Nature Trust, with um, which is. A, based on seeing lynx. It goes to an area known as Extremadura. And the lynx that are being seen in this region now, um, really am amazing the frequency with which they're being seen. The local conservation body there is known as CBD Habitat. And they deserve a huge amount of praise because if you go back to 1991, there was approximately about a hundred lynx in this area. Currently, the latest census has, has counted 500 lynx. Um, and that's due to the hard work of these conservation bodies and, and trying to attract tourism to give local people a livelihood and to give them therefore a vested interest in coexisting with, with the wildlife. Um, so um, great for birding, great for, for, for these cats um, down in, um, in, in that part of Spain. Um, next slide, please, Nadia. Not only Spain, um, but also Italy. Um, so a great trip that we run again under the auspices of the European Nature Trust in the Apennines in Abruzzo National Park. Um, and these trips can be taken as private groups. So if you've got a, a, a family of four, for example, or maybe a group of friends sort of five or six, um, these trips uh, become very affordable and very easy to do. We can also run them for you based on just a couple traveling. Um, so um, it doesn't have to be just just groups doing these particular sort of nature trips. Um, but in Abruzzo National Park, Nadia, if we could move on, um, you stay in some fabulous properties. Um, this place here is a, an old converted cave, um, which you stay at in a place called Santo Stefano de Sessiano, um, which is just outside the uh, Abruzzo National Park. Um, but you'll also stay in a fabulous little mountain refuge hut um, and you'll stay in some other wonderful little agriturismo properties. Um, and of course, the food and the wine is a big part of the experience. Um, but for me, the highlight is without doubt tracking the bears and the, and, and the wolves. If we could just go on to the next couple of slides quickly, Nadia. Um, the bears there are looked after by this wonderful conservation outfit, um, Salviamo Loso, which literally means save the bears. Um, and again, they've been doing some wonderful work to increase the bear population here. Bears in Cantabria, you're probably looking at about 350, probably only sort of 50 to 60 bears in Abruzzo National Park. Um, so they're trying to do a lot of work to try and link them up with other populations to maintain them. Um, and the wolves, again, um, you may have seen the BBC uh, documentary probably about a year ago now where they film wolves in the winter. And we do operate winter trips out to Abruzzo National Park to see the wolves. Um, but again, the opportunity to see them in their natural habitat, moving around the mountains as a pack, often from far away using optics, um, but still a, a, a wonderful wildlife experience, literally on your doorstep, you know, sort of two hours out of Rome. Thank you. I, I don't know if we heard the cousin of the wolf in the background there, maybe at one point, but... Uh, um, <laughs> Thank you for that, JK, as uh, informative and effusive as ever. But one note of caution, um, I think you dwelt on sort of wine and food quite a lot. So you might have to uh, find out that your wetsuit might have uh, shrunk the next time you try it on. So just be careful of that. Um, thank you both uh, for that. I just want to, uh, there's a few questions that we've come through and uh, we had earlier on. Um, one, maybe Laura, if you, you may or may not be able to answer it about, uh, Rosemary asked about Namibia. And I think a few people have asked about Namibia before that we've had uh, in the past, we've run trips with Africat. Uh, are there plans to to do something similar going forward, either either next year or 2022? Um, I think for next year, I think the majority of trips have kind of been sorted because a lot of them are made up of trips we were due to have this year. Um, but going forward, 2022, 23, I'm working on them at the minute. So it's useful to get feedback from people and clients because then we can build on that a lot of the trips we put together it's all through our passion but 
we did a survey a couple of years ago and the idea was to reach out to clients to hear where they wanted to go. All of our trips are created in-house. There's a small team of us that put them all together. And so it's useful to hear that. So I will add Namibia to the list. I, I think that's a good point about sort of uh, hearing from, from clients as to where, where they want to go. And we, we're, we're there to try and uh, service and fulfill that for them. Um, a few people who asked questions about Pakistan. Is there any thoughts on uh, a trip to Pakistan? We have a trip to Pakistan. What it's an incredible segment. trip. Um, Paul Craven, who I know a few people on the um, webinar have spoken to and know very well, he has kind of handcrafted that trip himself. He's been out there a couple of times, so it's with his knowledge. Um, and that trip will be accompanied by Diane Driscoll. She will be our expert. She has, we've worked with her for a number of years and she um, was one of the speakers at an event we did in London last year. She just brings everything to life. Um, and she is an incredible speaker, an incredible person to travel with. And I'm very jealous of the Pakistan trip because putting it together and kind of writing and, and putting it on the website, it just looks breathtaking, I have to say. I think it's worth, it's worth mentioning, uh, Justin, that um, you know, quite often the ideas for our group tours do come from our clients when they talk to tour leaders. Um, I know Sue Flood is a good one for, for getting her clients around the table with a few glasses of wine and saying, right, where are we going next? And Sue often comes back to us and says, right, you know, this group are really keen to now go to Japan or, 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 or Russian Arctic. Um, and so, you know, we really do rely on our clients, um, often through the medium of our, uh, of our tour experts, our tour leaders, um, to give us, um, yeah, the, the kind of feedback we need to, to keep our, our, our program as, uh, as imaginative and, and as exciting as possible. I, I think that's right. And, and as Sue has just said that on the chat as well, that's how the, the J Japan trip came about. Um, uh, Pakistan, as I think I've said before in a webinar, is one of my favourite destinations that I've been to. Um, and I know that Roy is asking about, uh, well, he, whilst it's pleased that we're showing that uh, our co close neighbours can also be exotic rather than travelling across the world, um, he still wants to meet people from re remote places. Um, and I know there was a question from Jane Baxter about uh, Mauritania. Uh, now, that's somewhere that I've always wanted to go to. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Senegal a couple of years ago, and my guide was so positive about it and advocating that I should travel there. Um, so if anybody else would like to uh, join me and then Jane on a pioneering trip there, um, then please let us know. Um, there's one more question that's come in from Suzanne. Um, let me just try and deal with that. Um, do we still have any special India trips for tigers um, and where you're able to go out with the rangers? Cool. Um, we've got a, a trip actually in partnership with New Scientist. It was due to be next year, um, but we're looking to push it into 2022 now. But that is um, in partnership with New Scientist. And it's it's kind of following the similar one that we, we did years ago where it was the kind of tracking ranges, but it's really got the tiger focus. Um, we've got an incredible kind of local expert on that and it's in partnership with Toft as well. So that's kind of going back to the sort of almost Discovery Initiatives days of that kind of tiger trip. So. All the details of that are on the website um, or give the team a call. They've got all the details. And the photography trip as well with, with, with Sue Flood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, maybe sort of if, if there's no more questions coming through that I can see, just end with a, a quote from Sue who's been mentioned a few times here. Um, and she says um, she feels very proud to guide for Steps Travel. And it's wonderful to have so many repeat clients who have become friends over the last few years. And she's guided trips to Japan, Antarctica, North America, Japan, Australia, the Arctic, Zambia, Brazil, and Russia. I love my job. No wonder. No wonder, Sue. Um, I, if there are no further questions coming through, um, I think we'll wrap up. And uh, I know that you mentioned Diane uh, Adriscoll, uh, uh, Lara, and she's kindly agreed to um, uh, be in our next webinar, which, as it says there, is um, Wednesday the 11th of uh, November uh, and we will send out uh, details shortly uh, about that. Um, I just want to say three thank yous. Um, a big thank you to you Lara um, for again your expertise or insights into the different trips and all you've done in as I said the logistical headache of, of moving trips uh, and keeping clients informed um, so thank you for that wonderful job. JK as ever well done you, um, thank you very much. Uh, and thirdly, thank you all for joining. 
Um, I hope that it's been informative, um, that you've learned a bit, um, and maybe three takeaways from me. Um, one is that uh, expertise and partnerships, um, whether it be the, the leader, the photographer, and or the, the conservation organization or association we work with, they do make a difference uh, and they really bring something uh, and add that value that Lara was talking to a trip. Um, I'd also say, whilst we might not be able to travel to some destinations that we want to, I would book now. Um, and we, like other tour, oper tour operators, like our suppliers, are being very flexible in terms of booking conditions. We're well aware of that. The uncertainty exists. Um, but it's better to have something, a marker in the sand now. And not least because I think that availability will become an issue, not necessarily now, but within the next six months or so for, for certain destinations uh, and for certain trips. Uh, and lastly, coexistence. Uh, it was the word that Jared used. Um, he did also use sustainable, but I won't go into that. Um, he used coexistence uh, and about sort of uh, uh, people and wildlife, and I think that's hugely important. But I also think that uh, we as a, as a race need to come together, um, get away from the sort of polemical rhetoric we hear at the moment, but come together to, to work through the pandemic and work through other big problems that we have, such as climate change. So on that note, I thank you again uh, and bid you good night. Have a very good evening. Thank you.